All right, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Brian Belinsky. I'm the president of the Slovak American Society, and I'd like to welcome you to today's book talk. I am a brave ridge, an American girl's hilarious and heartbreaking year in the fledgling Republic of Slovakia with Sarah Hinlicky Wilson. It's great to see a large virtual audience joining us here today. Um, I kindly request everyone to keep their microphones muted during the presentation. Um, but feel free during the, during the presentation to uh, post your questions to Sarah. And uh, after the presentation, we'll open up the floor for questions. And as a reminder, tonight's presentation is being recorded and will be made available soon on our YouTube channel. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to encourage those who are attending our events for the first time to consider becoming a member. Please visit us at dcslovaks.org for more information. Our speaker, Sarah, is a Lutheran, minutes, Lutheran pastor of the Slovak Zion Synod within the Evangelical Lutheran Church, Lutheran Church in America, and currently works at the Tokyo Lutheran Church in Japan serving the English language congregation. She is the founder of Thornbrush Press and co-host of the podcast, Queen of Sciences, Conversations Between a Theologian and Her Dad. I would also like to note that Sarah is the SASW's first second generation speaker following in the footsteps of her father, Paul Hinlicky. And now I'd like to turn the floor over to Sarah. Thank you very much, Brian. And hello and good evening to all of you DC Slovaks out there. I am so happy to be able to speak with you about my book and just to be among other enthusiasts of Slovakia. So I just want to show you quickly the cover here before I get going, but this is it. I am a brave bridge an American girl's hilarious and heartbreaking year in the fledgling Republic of Slovakia. You will recognize, of course, here the famous SNP bridge in Bratislava, what I like to call the Eiffel Tower of Slovakia. <laughs> and this here is St. George, um, not in his traditional colors, a little bit jazzed up for the cover. And instead of slaying a dragon, he is slaying a heart. That's my heart. Uh, and it's St. George because the town that we lived in in Slovakia was called Svetior, which of course means St. George. Okay, now it's over to me. And um, if you'd like, you can go to the upper right hand corner of your Zoom screen and click on speaker. And then you have a big picture of me, presumably instead of uh, the, the um, tiles. I, I'm guessing that's how it will work for you. I hope that works right. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about my book and how it came to be, and I'm going to intersperse it with readings from the book itself. And so that is how I will begin right now. This is from early on in the memoir talking about my first real train trip and the arrival in the ancestral town where my forebears came from reading from the book. I feasted my eyes on white lace curtains on the windows, countryside studded with red tile roofs and not a suburb in sight, and a dining car with a menu and waiters and real silverware. The Slovaks seem to prefer their own homemade picnics, untucking salami sandwiches on thick sliced bread and hard boiled eggs from their satchels. Dad and I took advantage of the vacancy to order fried pork cutlets and root, little knowing what awaited us on the other end. At Vrutki, we got picked up by car and transported to our ancestral village of Turani. My dad had been to Czechoslovakia twice before and done the rounds with all the third cousins once removed, but I was fresh blood primed for the initiation. So many relatives, all looking vaguely familiar, collided into me in waves of hugs, body smell, consonants, food, and slivovica. Ancient Milka, my great-grandfather's youngest half-sister, and her daughter, 
Marka, doesn't she look just like Aunt Anne? And Jan, Marka's son. And Jan, Marka's son-in-law. Nadia, Marka's daughter, married to the latter Jan, their children, Peter and Martinka, the first Jan's wife, Janka, and their daughters, Simonka and Janetka, Irenka, Marka's sister, buxom, gold-toothed, and owner of the local Potravini, which boasted one aisle for booze and chocolate, and one aisle for all the other groceries. And her daughter, Janka, and her daughter named what else but Janka, Tetka Betka, Aunt Betty, my grandfather's pen pal cousin throughout the communist years, and her kids, and their kids, and, and, and... Nobody cared whether I remembered their names, and it hardly mattered what my name was. Those who tried to learn it were baffled by my dad's introduction, because the American Sarah sounds not unlike the Slovak word for daughter, Sera. The principal thing our arrival signaled was the outbreak of an unholy war for the right, privilege, and status of feeding the Americans. Oh, I was hungry. During our Delhi sojourn, I had of necessity stifled a hunger for the whole wide world, equally eager for Hong Kong and Helsinki, London and Laza. Now I was finally feeding it, and the feeding inflamed the hunger rather than satiating it. My veracity for the world extended to actual foodstuffs, mysterious recombinations of familiar elements in startling ways, but a limitless hunger for the whole of human experience is not actually matched by a limitless physical appetite or I was no match for aggressive Slovak hospitality. The day after arrival, dad and I were compelled to consume five fried pork cutlet dinners, not to mention the potatoes, pickles, and cake at 10, noon, three, five, and seven. Eat up, dad ordered me in a desperate whisper at our fourth stop of the day. I'm sure they've gone to great expense to give us so much meat. This is an honor for them and they're showing honor to us. By hiding in the kitchen, I pleaded in equal desperation. Apart from their smattering of German, we had no common language. So half the time our hosts left us to eat in isolation. But I could imagine only too well the scene that would otherwise unfold at the Potramini the next day. The Americans don't seem to like fried pork very much. Really? They gobbled mine right up. Maybe they just don't like yours. I had lost the will to resist by the fifth and final iteration at some now forgotten distant cousin's house, tucking into the platter set before me as a buffer against the icky propositioning from the drunkard father of the family when his wife and my dad were looking the other way. I felt an uneasy sort of kinship with the museum-worthy collection of stuffed and mounted animal trophies we saw the next day at another relative's home. We ate fried pork there, too. So, as you can tell, this was my first trip ever to Slovakia, and it happened exactly six days after Slovakia became Slovakia. It was on January 6th, 1993, so the year of Slovakia's velvet divorce from its Czech sisters and brothers. We were there because my dad and his ancestors were all Slovaks and had maintained some kind of relationship with them over the years, obviously the gigantic communist project of 40 years put something of a damper on that. But when communism ended in late 1989 and the whole world began to shift, um, my dad in conversation with other Slovak American church leaders began to negotiate the possibility of our family moving back to Slovakia all these uh, decades later. So that is what happened after a few years of, of working towards it. Um, we planned as a family to move in August of 1993. I got to go on this January trip earlier that year to scope it out. I was in my last year of high school. I graduated a year early to accommodate the trip. And as you can tell, I was very eager. I had no regrets about ditching high school a year early and going on a great European adventure. 
so that is the setting that launches this entire book. My my one full year in Slovakia and the first of my family's um, six years there. And I would just like to say that um, all three of the family members who went on the trip are in the audience today. Dad, Mom, and Will, you're all out there. If you felt like waving so people can see you. Thank you. All right. So, but it's uh, one thing to experience a year in Slovakia when you are 17 and it has just become independent and is newly post-communist, but how does one come about writing a book on the topic? So I'm going to tell you now a little bit about the process of writing this book. So it began in a completely random and coincidental way. I was living in France, I'll get back to that later, and I had another American friend there named Macy Halford, and she was working on a memoir about growing up in Texas in a Southern Baptist church and this famous devotional called My Utmost for His Highest. Um, it was really just the fact that I met someone writing a memoir, <laughs> and um, I liked her and respected her, and her, hers is a wonderful book as well, but it just sort of put the question in my head, gee, could I write a memoir? Do I have anything to write about? My life has been pretty happy and simple. I don't know that I actually have anything dramatic enough to report, and then I thought, ah, you know, I lived in Slovakia in the year of its independence, and that, that was quite a year. I, you know, looking back, it really changed my life, was really important to me. Maybe there's a story in there. So I started brainstorming the idea, um, but the fact is it was more than half of my lifetime ago, and um, I remembered it from a teenager's perspective, but by the time I got to writing it, I was around 40, so had a different view of life than I did at 17. So I was clearly going to need some, some uh, material to fill in all the gaps um, in memory and knowledge. So a number of amazing things happened after that. The first is that I was able to recover a journal that I kept for the first month that we lived in Slovakia and um, record, read day by day my initial reactions to our family's move there. So that was pretty cool. Then I had talked to mom and dad about this and they were able to unearth all the letters that they and I wrote back to both sets of grandparents during that first year here. Now, I just want to signal what this means for future historians, which is that in 1993, people were not using email or, you know, like, the Silicon Valley giants were using it, but most people hadn't even discovered AOL at that point. Email was not a thing. Actually, in the course of the year, dad found out about email and started taking the first steps towards um, getting us email accounts. And in fact, I have recorded in the book his description of what email is and how it works. And it's really funny <laughs> what we all thought email was and how it worked back when it was starting. The point for my book is that this was basically the last year that I could rely on print records surviving that could be kept and recovered. I do not have any emails from 1994 through, I don't know, whenever I got my Gmail account in like 2010 or something. So that whole period of life is totally lost to me and maybe just as well. But anyway, so we had these family letters. And so I could go back and I like even remember the, the font and the, the thin paper we use so it wouldn't cost as much to mail from, from Slovakia and so forth. So that took me through the whole year in terms of like what we actually did where we traveled. I found out more about what my mom and dad were actually doing in their new work and all that kind of stuff. But I knew the one thing I most needed to make this book work was to find the letters that I wrote and mailed to a high school friend of mine named Colleen. She is very important to this book. And the fact that I got these letters from her is really kind of a miracle because skip forward a few years in our early 20s, we had one of those falling outs that only young women in their early 20s can have about no worthy cause whatsoever and didn't speak to each other for over a decade. <laughs> and then miraculously through Facebook, we got in touch once again and reconciled. Thank God for that. Um, but I still had not seen her in person more than 20 years after that falling out when I got this idea of writing the book. And then remarkably enough, it was her inviting me to her mother's funeral. Her mother died rather untimely. 
that she asked me to come back to the town we'd grown up in. And while I was there and we were fully reconciled by being together in person, I had told her I was thinking about this book and did she still have the letters? And she said, well, I think so. I can't guarantee anything, but let's see what we can find. So we ended up ransacking her childhood home and then her family's attic and miracle of miracles, she had 27 letters that I had handwritten or typed and sent through the postal service to her, and she was able to return them all to me. And I was able, I had kept all of hers too. So you see, even though we didn't speak to each other for a decade, we knew someday we wanted to be friends again. We kept each other's letters. So I was able to send back to hers the ones that she wrote to me. So having this in hand, um, I'd just like you all to stop for a minute and imagine what it's like to get firsthand access to your 17 year old psyche. Right, I know, it was traumatic <laughs> and very embarrassing, but absolutely essential to the writing of this story. It took me about two and a half days nonstop reading to get through all of these letters. And in the process, I rediscovered lots of things I had forgotten, but more importantly, I made the startling discovery that all along, I thought that there was a certain boy who was very significant in the story was the villain, but it turns out actually I was the villain. So that is another way in which um, being older and wiser can radically readjust your perspective on your teenage reality. So that was the firsthand knowledge I needed to reacquire in order to tell the story. And wonderfully, as I did remember, but had confirmation of through these letters, the whole year did follow kind of a perfect story arc. It was, there's a before and an after, but the year itself is kind of contained as one story. So it worked really well to just focus on this one year, 93 to 94. There is one other thing I really needed to do, though. Um, any of you who have ever been um, immigrants or even expatriates, you know that you acquire extremely random bits of information about your new country. Like you don't come in, you know, with the whole elementary and high school education, which still may not be very accurate, but you just kind of like pick up stuff all over the place and um, you put it together in your head, but there are like all these holes that you don't know in your own historical record. And so I realized the other thing I wanted to do is I didn't just want to tell my story in Slovakia. I wanted to tell Slovakia's story as best I could. So I really needed to go back and figure out where all these random bits of information fit into reality. So I spent a lot of time reading histories of Slovakia, histories of the region, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, a lot of stuff about communism. I really wanted to understand that. So we came so soon after its end. And if you've been there recently, you know, even now it's still on the landscape and in the psyche of people, even after, you know, more than 30 years since its end. So I, I filled in um, a lot of um, details that way. And I also started a project to try to read every Slovak novel ever translated into English. I actually am still working on this. I didn't know it would there be so many or it would take so long. Uh, if you go to my website, sarahhenlickywilson.com, you can discover my Slovak novels and English series. I write reviews of all of them. It's often really strange how these books came into English but uh, I should be up to 40 before too much longer. So um, anyway, but that was another thing I wanted to do is kind of get a sense for Slovak literature and what it was like. Uh, I would say that has confirmed for me that despite uh, all my delusions, I really am American and not Slovak. I definitely wrote an American's book in Slovakia not a Slovak's book in Slovakia. Anyway, so last bit on the writing of the book, I wrote it uh, over the course of about two years from 2016 to 2018, and it turned out that the timing was really important for writing this book too. I'm sure it would have been different if I'd written it sooner in life or later, but those two years were spent in Minnesota, which is as foreign a land as any I've ever lived in. And uh, it was after my husband and son and I had lived in France for almost eight years and we were trying to figure out what the next step was. And in those two years in Minnesota, it turns out the next step was Japan, which caught all of us by surprise with no background in anything Asian <laughs> whatsoever. So it turned out that going back and looking at my family and especially my parents move to a very foreign country. Um, remember, this is right after the end of communism, Americans going behind the former Iron Curtain just four years after. Um, going back and seeing what it meant to my parents to move to a foreign country in their 40s, as I was about to do, 
it really helped me think through what my international life was, how I, how I got to be that way. And it was good preparation for moving here. And amazingly enough, my husband and son and I touched down in Japan 25 years to the day after the four of us Henlikis arrived in Slovakia. So that seems too significant to ignore. All right, I am now going to read a second excerpt to you. Now this jumps forward from my initial January visit of 1993 to the day after arrival in August, 1993. I got up late in the morning, disoriented and ill-equipped to puzzle out how to shower without a curtain around the tub. And in place of a shower head, a floppy tube that coiled and leapt like an angry snake if I turned on the water without gripping it firmly. Dad was already off with Julius to open a bank account and Will outside playing with Peter. The vigorous noon bells galvanized my mom, herself dazed and drowsy into action. She recruited me to join her in braving the Potravini, the tiny grocery store embedded in a family home like most businesses in town to find some food. Except, the Potravini closed at 12 and didn't reopen till three. Shopkeepers need to eat lunch too, you know. We came back and stood in the barren kitchen at a loss. One expected to face famine as a missionary in Ethiopia, say, but not in Europe for heaven's sake, even if it was Eastern Europe. I couldn't scrounge up so much as a packet of airplane pretzels. The doorbell rang. Anna had anticipated just such an eventuality and sent over lunch in a basket. A pot of potato, carrot, celery, kohlrabi soup with a swirl of eggs beaten in. Egg drop soup, I thought in amazement. A plate of palatsinki, thin pancakes rolled with apricot or raspberry jam and dusted with cinnamon sugar, and a bottle of mineral water. Her proud couriers were Will, Peter, Ulo, and another young man who beamed at us between his dimples, Misho. That's when I knew it was going to be all right, even in Svetior. So began a golden month of summer in which the rain never fell, the stars glittered every night, and the roses. For being a town so lacking in lawns, Svetior was replete with roses magenta and salmon and lemonade colored, their fragrance shimmering up from the scorching sidewalks and perfuming the whole assemblage of concrete and red tile and terraced vineyards undulating along the foothills of the little Carpathians. Bags unpacked, time zone adjusted, and visa status still iffy. Dad decreed that the next order of business was to hire a Slovak tutor. Monica, a first-year university student and member of the Lutheran Church beneath our apartment, manifested herself in our nearly empty living room, as silent and docile as the mouse she resembled. Since mom had learned her Slovak hospitality skills from our Olympic class Turani relatives, she instructed me to offer Monica a cup of tea. No, oh, thank you, Monica replied in whispered English. Are you sure, I said? No, thank you, she repeated. It's no trouble. No, thank you. You really don't want some tea? Yes, please, I would like some. From this, I deduced that four polite refusals equal one genuine refusal. Any fewer than that and a pivot is still possible, which means a good host must also offer four times. All at once, I realized what ghastly gluttons we must appear to be, always accepting on the first offer, never knowing there were several more rounds to cycle through. No wonder we got stuffed so full of pork cup. Okay, moving on now. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the American migrant experience means. I'm sure many of you who are part of the DC Slovaks come from Slovak stock somewhere back in your line. Maybe some of you are newer immigrants to the United States. And so writing this book really made me think in a fresh way about 
what it means that the United States is composed almost entirely of either migrants, most willing, but certainly a significant number of unwilling migrants, um, with a very small Native American population. So almost entirely our culture is formed by people who have come all over the world, who have chosen to be here, but somehow don't have that ancestral connection to the land itself. Um, even, you know, the the longest lived um, migrants um, in terms of their family line don't go back much more than four or 500 years. And if you've been to Europe, you know that a four or 500 year old building isn't really that old. <laughs> and a history that goes back only four or 500 years isn't really that deep of a history. So there was the fact of just trying to understand like what it meant to me, trying to find my own identity as I was growing up, you know, to be you know, now characterized as a white person. But um, as I learned in writing this book, um, that wasn't really how it was for even my dad's generation already. They were much more ethnically identified and they wouldn't have necessarily seen themselves as having lots in common with the, uh, the Anglos um, or the Germans or the Italians. You know, there was much more of a ethnic distinctions among people who had a European background. I also was reflecting as I wrote this book on the fact that I so strongly identified as a Slovak. Um, my mom's side of the family is German and Danish, but I think because they came that much sooner, but also because of two world wars, uh, German identity was not something that you trumpeted quite as loudly or proudly. Whereas on my dad's side, and we also lived closer in the US to my, my dad's extended family, there was a much stronger ethnic sense. Um, my dad's dad was a pastor of a Slovak American congregation, and he actually continued to preach and do services in Slovak until he retired in the early 80s. And I remember going to potlucks at that church and getting kind of equal portions Italian food and Slovak food. <laughs> the Slovaks clearly had no problem with like ziti and lasagna, but they also made their, their uh, stuffed cabbage rolls and um, all the sweets that you are accustomed to from, from Slovak events. So somehow, and you know, my, my dad retained some bits of the language, so did my grandfather. Um, in fact, my grandfather used to scold us with the word hunsut, which means something like rascal. Um, I have asked, uh, Slovak still use it. It's kind of old fashioned sounding, but um, it is a, a recognized word. So in these little ways, the, the identity carried on, but somehow clearly for me as a kid and a, a teenager trying to find an identity, this was, was really important to me. So I think that's why looking back on it, it was so exciting for me to think about moving to Slovakia. Um, I know I, when I've talked to other people about this, they were like, you had to leave high school early and say goodbye to all your friends. Weren't you, weren't you sad and angry about that? And no, <laughs> I didn't, I, nothing against the friends, but high school itself was not a compelling enough experience to make me sad about losing the last year of it. But I think looking back for me, it was like, I'm going home now. Like I'm, I'm a Slovak in exile. This trip dad and I made in January of 1993, like just completely enchanted me with all the castles and the, the lovely old homes and the traditional way of life. Um, you know, there was a fair amount, again, of, of a teenage delusion in that. But there was a sense for me that I, I was finally getting back to my people where, where I belonged. And again, the irony here is that depending on whether you count through my uh, grandfather or grandmother's line, I'm a third or fourth generation Slovak in the US. Um, on my grandmother's side, it's so far back, we don't even know the names of the people who immigrated to the US. We only know the ones who were born already here in the United States. My grandmother already didn't grow up with the Slovak language. She had to memorize her catechism for confirmation in Slovak because that's what her church was, even though she didn't understand the language at all. Um, so it was important in kind of cultural and family identity, but it wasn't like a living thing anymore. It was, it was much more kind of at the margins. And yet I still um, felt like this was mine. I've learned recently that um, there's an opportunity for people whose ancestors immigrated from the Czechoslovak Republic from 1918 to you know, the late 1930s um, to get citizenship. But if your ancestors came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, doesn't apply. And that was the first time I thought, oh, you know, my grandparents and their ancestors all knew they were Slovaks, but actually their 
their, I don't think the word is citizenship, they were subjects, let's say, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And suddenly it just kind of like blows your mind that you can have this connection to an, a defunct empire that was put to death in 1918, more than a hundred years ago. Um, so I guess the question is, is why did I still think of myself as a Slovak after all those years? I think there's just something um, over the generations of the melting pot that makes you, maybe makes people of European background feel kind of generic and uninteresting. <laughs> Um, I think that's why organizations like, like this, uh, DC Slovaks, exist because you know that there's something really valuable and precious there that you don't want to lose entirely. Um, my mother-in-law, for instance, she's descended from Swedish immigrants and she's gotten Volunteer of the Year awards at the, uh, the Swedish um, Institute in Minneapolis. Um, and that's really important to who she is, even though, again, she didn't grow up with the language. I think her parents um, still spoke it when they were small, but not as adults. So there's something there that it's it's um it's kind of a bittersweet thing because you know this is this is your ancestors, this is where you came from, this is part of who you are, and yet the longer your family tarries in the United States, the the less tied you are to it anymore, and it can it becomes maybe you know like a hobby or a genealogy, but not necessarily life. So for me, the idea was like, well, I'm, I'm going back. Um, I don't think I, I know, I did not appreciate how much an American sojourn of a hundred years or more really does change you. Um, and not only that, Slovakia's history in the 20th century was so different from the United States. It wasn't like hopping from, you know, Slovakia to, uh, you know, Germany or something. This was very radically different historical trajectories. And that hundred years in between made such a difference culturally. So anyway, when we get to the, the question and answer portion in a bit, I, you know, if any of you have your own thoughts about this, about what the migrant experience means, both long-term for Americans, as well as with your own particular relationship to Slovakia, um, I, I'd really like to, to hear more. And maybe my book can also help you think through what that means to you. Okay, I'm going to read another excerpt now. And this deals a little bit with my my Slovak ancestors. We're now up to uh, September of 1993. Talking about the thrill of not being in a classroom. For the first time in memory, September was but a happy extension of August. My usual resentment at the month could be set aside to enjoy the runnels of cool air flowing down the hillsides and the crunch underfoot of horse chestnuts, still encased in their spiky alien green shells. Far from being bored, I took to the quiet streets like an exiled princess returned to her realm. Because, as it turned out, one of my great-grandmothers bore the surname Sodori, a Slovak corruption of Hungarian Zentjörd, which means, drumroll please, Saint George. In other words, Svetiur, the town we were living in. According to a document unearthed from the bowels of an archive in Sabino, the region in eastern Slovakia from which the Sidoris immigrated, this particular set of ancestors had been invited about 800 years earlier to relocate from Swabia to Svetiur, develop its vineyards, and erect fortifications around the city. They weren't very good at it though, because the town was caught unprepared by the first Tatar invasion in 1241. Slovak mothers still scold naughty children with the warning, if you don't behave, the Tatars will get you. The Zent Dürd's status as petty nobility survived the debacle, as witnessed by their adoption of a Hungarian surname, but in due course, they dispersed east. Perhaps post-Tatars, they were no longer much loved by the people of Svetiur. Those who went to Sabino in time Slovakicized and accordingly altered their name again to the Slovak friendly spelling of Sedori. Being Slovak and being poor go together, historically speaking, which is why the family, already inclined to migrate, finally moved on to America. And now in me, the family was migrating back to its old haunts once more. As heir apparent, never mind the fact that one of my medieval foremothers went by the moniker 
humpbacked Elizabeth, I surveyed my town, surely not a mere village, with a sense of magnanimous entitlement. Everything pleased. The tiny yards sprouting pansies and blue chicory, shaded by apple and pear trees so heavily laden with fruit that their limbs had to be propped up on wooden ladders. The cuddly dogs that took advantage of their invisibility behind the massive front doors to terrorize passersby with snarls. The priest from across the street, leading fresh-faced girls in fancy white dresses, clutching ribbons attached to a statue of the Virgin Mary in celebration of their first communion. The very essence of ancient, wise, civilized European culture cast its spell upon me one night when the four of us joined the philos for the grape harvest. As the air cooled and the sun set, I grabbed a pair of scissors and followed behind Anna, snipping off clusters as golden as the banner of the Holy Roman Empire. I tipped my grapes into a huge wooden vat, even the fungusy or blackened or spoiled ones. In winemaking, ripeness contaminates spoilage instead of the other way around. We took turns walking the big lever round and round the vat to compress the grapes. The gushing juice was the sweetest I'd ever tasted. When we finished, the men transported the juice to the wine cellar beneath the church and siphoned it into glass demijohns, each wide enough to wrap your arms around twice. There it was to ferment till Christmas when it would be ready for filtering. The cellar itself was straight out of Edgar Allan Poe. Its walls curved to form a low arch overhead, all the sto stones mortared in place with a dirt floor underfoot. The place was lit only by candles and the smell was of centuries of mushroomy rich decay lifted by a faint breath of sour, the ghost of spilled wine passed. Julius dipped a long glass siphon into a glowing amber demijohn of the previous year's wine. He sucked the wine into a sphere at the top of the siphon, which sported a tiny hook handle while blocking the hole at the bottom with his index finger. When we had glasses at the ready, he released his finger to let the wine trickle in. It was a green Veltliner, darling of the Carpathians. White wine was so ubiquitous, they used it even at communion a far cry from the industrial ruby port I'd grown up with. I sipped at my first proper grown-up glass of wine as Julius, pointing toward a narrow tunnel disappearing into unseen murk, told us it led to an escape route to the hills dug centuries ago when the Tatars invaded, or maybe it was the Turks. Turning to look too fast, I knocked over a glass of wine set on the bench. Julius smiled indulgently. In Slovakia, we say, if a girl spills a glass of wine accidentally, she's going to be married soon. So now a little bit about the actual experience I had when I got there. As I said, it was this remarkable year of 1993. We came about halfway through. At the time we got there, Slovakia still did not have its own currency. It was using Czechoslovak crowns and it did not have its own postage. I actually have a, a physical letter that has both Czechoslovak and Slovak postage combined onto one. They were obviously trying to use up all the Czechoslovak stamps before they switched over fully to the Slovak ones. And also, of course, it was so soon after communism. And so I think that was probably the most interesting part for me. Um, I was only 13 when the Berlin Wall fell and 17 by the time we got to Slovakia. But even being relatively younger, it was so much in the air. You know, I, I grew up, my childhood was in the 80s. I was aware of the evil empire, of the Soviet Union, of the potential of nuclear war, um, of the fact simply that we had all these relatives. We knew that we had them who were behind an iron curtain that we could never reach. And so to be going across that, that old border and live on the other side had a kind of um, accident at the side of the road fascination for all of us. Um, Bratislava was very slow to get the kind of Western investments that Prague got almost immediately. So in the year that we lived there, there was no Western store at all. 
Um, in time, the Prior, which was the old like communist department store, was bought out by Kmart, which the Slovaks pronounced Kmart. <laughs> and towards the end of that first year, a Little Caesars pizza pizzeria opened up inside the Kmart. Um, but that was it. We had to travel to Germany or Brno in the Czech Republic if we wanted McDonald's, which at the time was, was very exciting for me. Not so much anymore. But at the time, it was a pretty big deal. Um, if you go to Bratislava now, it's usually full of tourists, not as bad as Prague, but lots of tourists, lots of bars, lots of boutiques to buy all kinds of things. Um, the year that we lived there, it was empty. It was really empty on the weekends. Um, everybody just went back to the village to work in the garden or go skiing, but nobody stayed in the city for the weekend. There was no party life there at all. Um, there was maybe two shops that sold um, folk art, that were just continuations of the communist collectives because the communists approve of folk art. Uh, that was the closest you could get for souvenirs. Um, but like uh, the Irish pub was not there and all the things that kind of make it a, a lively capital city now, it was just um, quiet. The buildings were really run down. There was only the very beginning of the, um, of the uh, reconstruction projects. The castle was still brown and tarnished looking, not bright white like it is now. Um, so, and then of course there's Petržalka <laughs> and, and even in Sveti Jur on the, the far side of the highway, there were the ugly communist buildings, the apartments that were so gray and soulless. Um, so that, that was really a, a kind of upfront and, and personal look at what this 40 year experiment with communism had done and, and the damage. I would say among the people my age, there was less of a sense, either there was less sense of it or they were so forward looking, they didn't talk about it very much. I know my, my parents and, and people their age and older had much more talking and processing or refusal to talk about what they had gone through, or the compromises that had been forced on them through this time. But as a something that was kind of always in the air and around and nobody knew for sure then if it was really gonna take forever. That's why Slovakia and its neighbors were very eager to get into NATO so that they could be safe if, if uh, big brother Russia ever changed his mind about letting them go their own way. But comically, I think the, the two things that stand out to me most as the, the uh, personal life impact of communism are first, um, all the women of a certain age dyed their hair the same ugly purplish auburn color. And in classic American fashion, I thought, why do they all choose the same ugly color? But of course, the whole point of a centralized economy is that nobody chooses but the centralized planners. So up until that point, only one color of hair dye for women even existed. And that's why they chose it. It was that or gray, pretty simple. The other thing was that when I would visit friends' homes, I would notice in their bathrooms, they would have so many products, just bottles and jars and packages of just like everything, like far beyond anything I ever saw in even my most makeup obsessed high school friends medicine chest. And I was utterly perplexed by this. And again, my inference was, well, I guess this is runaway American consumerism taking over Slovak society. But as I found out later and had confirmed by multiple sources, it wasn't that. It was that the principle in communism was that if you see a product, you buy it because the chances of your ever seeing it again are almost nil because things were produced so randomly, so inconsistently, so you just bought it. And the fact is now it is true, more products were coming in, but it never occurred to the people in those early days post-communism that it would be there next month and the month after and the month after that, that you could resupply at a reasonable rate. So they just bought everything that they saw and gradually their bathrooms got taken over by all of these bottles and jars of all the products they suddenly had access to. So that's the communist thing. But of course, there are, are other layers. Um, if you're interested, again, in, in the question time, you, you can ask more specifically. But we were also very well aware that Slovakia had been made a puppet state of the Nazis during the Second World War. So there is that kind of bitter feeling of betrayal by the Germans. Um, in particular, in our um, Lutheran congregation in Sveti um, because of its location, uh, a great 
deal of its old population had been German Lutherans. And when the Nazis came to power, those German Lutherans separated themselves from Slovak Lutherans and Hungarian Lutherans because they wanted to be a pure Aryan church. So there was this very profound sense of betrayal that the Germans had pulled out uh, when they should have been bound together by religious and confessional bonds. Instead, they let their ethnic bonds overrule everything else. But we also learned about ways in which um, even the, there's very tragic history of the Holocaust in Slovakia and almost all of its Jewish population was deported and murdered. Um, we also heard a few <laughs> tiny hopeful stories of people who offered resistance, who realized that they were not being deported to labor camps. That was the, the public line that they were going to labor camps to atone for their economic sins, not to death camps, simply to be exterminated. Um, and ways in which some of the, the um, Lutheran and Catholic leaders saw what was going on and tried to speak out against it, um, tragically with very little effect, but um, it was known. Um, that uh, by some and the alarm was raised in some ways. So that was that was always kind of lingering there too. Um, of course, the communists weren't really better. They deliberately raised uh, R-A-Z-E-D, the old Jewish neighborhood to make way for the SNP bridge, which is on the cover of my book, just trying to erase that. There's a very nice memorial now um, but between like the bridge and the cathedral in Bratislava, you can see trying to remember what they had, um, what they had removed. Um, in the book itself, um, the most important, um, super, at least superficially important aspect of the whole thing of this, my, my going back to the homeland and trying to connect with it and make myself one with it um, was not through the history though, or even through my ancestry, it was through the boys. And it turns out Slovak boys are absolutely adorable. And um, even better than that, they seem to find that American girls absolutely adorable. I'm sure I was the one and only they ever met. And uh, maybe if I had count competition, I would not have done so well. Um, but for someone who had been, had braces and glasses and been awkward and smart and smart in uh, high school to suddenly be this um, inarticulate exotic foreigner was a, a very um, intriguing experience went to my head. Uh, the ill consequences of that are, are played out in my book. As I said, I discovered in the end, I was the villain, not the poor innocent boys. Not totally innocent, but anyway. Um, so that was a big part of my uh, my falling in love with Slovakia, but it was very much intertwined, the sense of, of Europe and the old country, the old ways, just the architectural beauty, the natural beauty of Slovakia, but also this these romances, this attention, being exotic and important, um, they all went together. But in the end, and, and this is um, where I'll finally reveal the, um, the meaning of the ridiculous um, title of the book, <laughs> there was what happened over the course of the year is I discovered that I am certainly of Slovak ancestry and I'm proud of that and I love it, but I'm not a Slovak actually. I'm not even really a Slovakian, a word I detest and I hope all of you detest that word too and, and try to please write to the New York Times and tell them it's not Slovakian, it's Slovak. Anyway, um, but that I actually really am an American. I'm very much shaped by that. And Part of being American is being shaped by your immigrant heritage. So I think it is fair to say that though I'm an American, I'm an American shaped by my particular Slovak heritage. Um, but then, you know, I, I came back to the US feeling very displaced there after our year. Um, I found it really hard to talk to nearly all of my high school friends, just Colleen, who'd been getting my 27 letters over the course of the year. She was the one I could still really talk to. But it was suddenly like I had nothing in common with anyone else. Like my world, my perception of the world had changed so radically. And so I've had a much more complicated and nuanced um, relationship to the fact of my being American since then. I think actually I've come to appreciate it more and what America historically and um, um, I guess politically, culturally can stand for at its best. Um, I've really gained an appreciation from that from living in other countries. Um, I think the, the superficial um, polarization we see or manifestations of like consumer culture. I mean, those are, those are genuinely American things too. Um, but I think stepping out of your culture 
allows you to see kind of like the, the root logic of it and what is honorable and good there. And so um, oddly, even though I've spent so much of my adult life now outside of the US, I think it was precisely by leaving it that I came to appreciate it more. And so the way I finally put this all together is um, to go back to the beginning. Um, before we moved to Slovakia, we had this little tiny Slovak grammar book. I remember it had a green cover. I don't know if there even were any Slovak grammars available at the time. And I remember paging through it, just kind of randomly looking at words I didn't really study seriously before we moved. But I found two words that I thought put together were hilarious. One was smelly, which means brave or bold. And the other was most, which means bridge. And put them together, you can say smelly most. You you know, like it sounds in English, very smelly. I thought that was hilarious. And I remember sharing it with my little brother. Well, <laughs> how funny that was, smelly most. I am, and so I put together my first ever sentence in Slovak was, ja som smelly most. I am a brave bridge, just so I could say I am most smelly. I mean, that's how it sounded to me. And before we moved, people would say to me and Will, um, so have you learned any Slovak yet? And Will would invariably pipe up, yes, I can say, yes, I'm smelly most. And they, you know, the Americans would hear smelly most and they'd be like, oh, what does that mean? And then Will would say, it means I am a brave bridge. And then people would look even more confused because like what on earth is a brave bridge? That's a, like a completely meaningless statement. So anyway, you know, that was just kind of a, a funny joke we had in the family all these years. But then when I'm living in the foreign land of Minnesota and working on this book and trying to figure out like what, what is the end of this story? <laughs> like how do I, is it just when I step on the plane to go back to America or, or you know what where does this really this tale come to an end I remember very distinctly walking through the beautiful lush green lawns of St. of St. Paul Minnesota and suddenly having the phrase come into my head I am a brave bridge and then like everything in my mind twirled around and I was like that's it I am a brave bridge my whole life has been one of being a bridge and it takes a lot of courage to connect these different places. So I'm a bridge between America and Slovakia. I later became a bridge with France. Um, the work I did there in ecumenism was trying to reach out between estranged Christian groups and get them to talk with each other. Um, I'm a brave bridge now between the West and the East um, with Asia, Japan being here. I've served now in an international congregation. And it just suddenly was like, here we thought we were saying this funny, meaningless statement, but in fact, it was kind of like the motto for what my life would become to become a brave bridge. And so uh, I hardly need to convince all of you here that um, our world is in desperate need of brave bridges, people who are willing to stand between two places and not let them be cut off and isolated from each other, but to be connected it's hard work being a bridge. Um, it's cold and windy sometimes. You're not really at home on either side of the shore, but um, the world needs bridges. So I would say um, I uh, even sometimes I still have complicated feelings. I kind of wish I could just live on one side or the other and be at, at ease there. But um, I think finally, this is what I'm called to do with my life to be this brave bridge. And I hope that maybe some of you will um, will find that that concept or idea speaks to you and helps you make sense of your own bridge work in your life. And now I'm going to conclude with one more excerpt. And after that um, stirring and meaningful summons, this is a little bit of humor to wrap up my presentation. And this is about what happens when you try to learn a foreign language. There is some mysterious force in the universe that compels new speakers of a language to commit errors of propriety. Somehow the obscene will always out. Mom was the first to be sacrificed on the altar of embarrassment. My parents were so taken with the Philo's homemade wine that they decided to buy grapes of their own and have a crack at it. Julius placed the order with the local vineyard. The shipment was delayed, we should have expected that. And one day, mom thought to ask Anna for an update. She said, have our grapes arrived yet? That's what she intended to say anyway. The word for grapes is rosno. But the word that came out of her mouth was one my dad had taught her in the early days of their courtship, 
hovno. What she actually said was, has our shit arrived yet? Anna took it well. She may have even giggled a little. Dad certainly did. But when the time came, his violation was an order of magnitude worse. How do you commend yourself at work when you can't converse? A fair number of dad's new colleagues were fluent in German, but his German ebbed as the Slovak was busy seizing the real estate of his brain. For a while, he was caught in an awkward limbo between the two. Solution? Use a dictionary to work up a repertoire of set phrases in Slovak and use them liberally. One of his favorites was, I am so zrušený to be here in Slovakia. What a great opportunity. What an honor. I'm so zrušený. This was addressed to elder professors, entire classrooms, and shy young female students. Until the day his teaching assistant Magda caught him at it. She turned as red as the Soviet flag. Oh, professor, she whispered, covering her face. Don't say that. Moral of the story, never trust a dictionary translation of the word excited. For a while, I avoided major humiliations. I learned the clever device of pausing at the near end of a word whose case-appropriate suffix I couldn't remember and arranging a bashful look on my face. Inevitably, some compassionate Slovak would jump in and confirm my choice of word, but also, here's the clever part, instinctively provide the correct suffix in the process. So I'd look smart for getting the word right while evading the embarrassment of not knowing the ending. Klapets? Klopsovi, klopsok, klopsami. Unfortunately, endings weren't the only place I could go wrong. As the weather grew colder, I got a beautiful maroon woolen coat buttoned across the chest and sweeping down to my feet, standard Central European protection against the elements. I wore it proudly to youth group one night, eliciting admiration. Alica, Sonia's younger sister, asked me when I'd gotten it. Pozaitra. I promptly announced, the day after tomorrow. They stared. Uh, I meant predvcherom, predvcherom, I stammered, the day before yesterday. It was too late. Admiration gave way to hilarity. For the rest of the winter, people sidled up to me and said, hey, Sarka, when did you get that coat? And I would dutifully, if a little irritably, reply, the day after tomorrow. <clears throat> But to me fell the granddaddy of all inopportune errors of vocabulary, judgment, and decorum. It was a Sunday, and we were paying a visit to the dean of the theological faculty. Dean Andreovich was a round Slavic dumpling. His wife was the platonic form of the middle-aged Slovak woman. Hair dyed the ubiquitous red auburn. A see-through white blouse pitched over a military brassiere pantyhose trapping in place the wavy seaweed patterns of unshaven leg hair. My dad preached at the morning service, and afterwards we were fed lunch. Will and I, seen but not heard, sat through the expected rotation of chicken soup with noodles, fried pork with potatoes, and poppy seed cake. At last we were released from the burden of politeness and escaped, from the back, escaped to the backyard. The minutes dragged on. No books, no computer games. We kicked around desperately wondering when the visit would be over and we could go home. At last, Andreovich came out the back door to check on us. He stood on the little stoop, looking grim and gray like a prized product of socialism. As ambassadors of our own nation, I felt duty bound to be polite. I decided to make small talk. Dean Andreovich, I enunciated with flawless diction. I can hear your cock crowing. It was even worse than it sounds. The noun of choice was not an unfortunate synonym for rooster. It was that word in Slovak, the one that scores 10 out of 10 on the scandal meter. Unluckily sharing three out of the five letters with the word I'd meant to say. As if that weren't bad enough, 
I'd affixed the ending for masculine animacy as if to suggest the particularly living quality of the object in question. Nice little missionary's daughter, I dropped the nuclear bomb of expletives on my dad's boss. Rooster, 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 I shrieked, trying to erase what I'd said. My frantic efforts only confirmed that I knew perfectly well what filth had issued from my mouth, a word I shouldn't have known at all. Andreovich's eyes widened, and he beat a hasty retreat through the back door. We left soon after. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. That was that was a, a very entertaining presentation. Uh, I definitely want to I definitely want to read the book now. <laughs> so I'm sold. Uh, so let me take a quick look at the chat here to see if there are any questions. Um, so well, someone wants to know if I'm still in Japan. I am. It is currently 9:40 a.m. It's Friday here. I know it's Thursday for the rest of you. Okay. Um, all right, I guess the, for the first question tonight, um, I'll turn it over to uh, Helen Fedor. Uh, okay, Sarah, um, in your book, you were talking about um, the difference in the Shtedri Vecher uh, meal for Christmas Eve, how the Lutherans eat kapusnitsa with sausage and all kinds of other meat, and uh, the Catholics have a meatless meal. Were there other uh, differences be, uh, between the Lutherans and Catholics in the foodways? You know, okay, it's interesting you mentioned that because some Slovaks I've talked to had it the other way around, <laughs> that, that Catholics eat kapusnica and Lutherans eat mushroom soup. So I'm not actually sure that the boundary is quite as clear as they make it out to be. And in fact, that was very much, I think, my experience that for for good historical reasons, Lutherans and Catholics or Catholics and all kinds of Protestants still want to sharply distinguish themselves from one another in Slovakia, when in fact, they have so much common cause and frankly, so many common enemies <laughs> that they really should like let it go already. I know, easy for an American and an ecumenist to say, but um, that is the only one that I'd ever heard of where there was a specifically Lutheran Catholic difference in food, but uh, maybe other people know of others. Um, I don't know if maybe there's a, like a Good Friday or Easter difference, maybe. Um, okay, well, pardon my ignorance. Um, when it comes to the major holidays, oftentimes Catholics will have a meatless um, meal before it. Do the Lutherans fast like that before a um, uh, major holiday or is it just not the only thing. Lutherans I have ever heard of fasting in any way, shape, or form are in Poland, and I can only assume that's because of the overwhelming Catholic presence there. But I would say probably it was historically a point of honor among Protestants not to fast, because that's what Catholics did, and we are not Catholic. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. All right, the next up for, for a question is uh, Owen Johnson, so if you please unmute yourself. Um, thank you. Um, Sarah, in your book, you, you write about working in the library at the theological faculty, and you, you know, mention about being with the church youth group and so forth. But I'm curious, in retrospect, how much did your experience in Slovakia influence your call to the ministry? <laughs> That's a good question. So when I was um, reading over my letters to Colleen, I discovered that towards the end of my year there, I had a dream that I wasn't going to study German or French in college as I expected, but I would study Greek. And I had been studying biblical Greek at the theological faculty during the, the year preceding. And in my letter, I woke up said, I have no idea what that's supposed to mean. Now it seems very funny to me because the meaning of the dream is obvious. Like I'm going to continue with biblical Greek. I'm going to continue into theological studies. So I can't help but think that there was some 
very significant formation that was happening there. Um, my church back home in the U.S. was so small that we didn't really have a youth group. So my time in Sveti Yoda was actually my first experience of being with a large group of young people who were who were conscious um, and committed believers. And um, sometimes I didn't get it and it, I felt uncomfortable with it. Um, but in other ways, it was it really made a powerful impact on me. And for them, you know, it was so different because they were allowed to be public about their faith. Um, in fact, some of them were baptized when they were older. I mean, normally Lutherans baptize as infants, um, and some of them hadn't been because their parents feared the repercussions. So, you know, they, they had a memory of being baptized, and like me, I was too, I'm too small to remember the event itself. So in those kind of ways, I think it was, it was kind of making it um, more present and conscious for me. But uh, the, say, the truth is also that I'm a pastor's kid. My dad is a pastor's kid. I grew up in church all my life. I was at every service, including all the, the non-Sunday morning ones, um, had a very lovely congregation growing up. So I'm not sure that Slovakia made all the difference in that respect, but it certainly did make a difference. And um, in fact, earlier this summer, I gave a, a talk for um, a conference of Lutheran women pastors in Slovakia. And was, you know, that was, that was really a special thing for me to be able to talk about Darina Bansikova, the first ordained Lutheran woman in Slovakia and um, just kind of help support um, pastors there too. That was a, a, a nice way to continue to keep up this debt of gratitude and, and connection that I have there. And I see you have Sveti Jura in the background of your uh, <laughs> Zoom there, very nice. It didn't look like that when we arrived in 1993, let me tell you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I, as I've told you, I have memories going back to Slovakia in the early 1970s. So for me, the change is like a miracle. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, thanks, Owen, for your question. Um, so if, uh, so there's no uh, outstanding questions in the chat. So if you want to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Ken, you want to go? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, this just occurred to me. You you went there right after independence in 1993. Did you get any impressions of how Slovaks felt about uh, the separation, about the Velvet divorce uh, with, with the Czechs? Uh, did you get any impressions of how people, you know, uh, felt about that or related to that? Or was it they were apathetic or? You know, they didn't really think about it much. Or... Yeah, I mean, again, I would have had more of an impression from people my age, but I think there was a tremendous sense of pride that they were finally independent. Um, and I did in my my study of um, Slovak history over the past hundred years, it is true that they were the Slovak side was much less equipped to become a modern democracy than the Czech side. And that has everything to do with Austrian versus Hungarian overlordship and what they kind of allowed to the, the respective Czech and Slovak um, subjects. Um, so a lot of Czechs came to the Slovak side in the you know 1920s and took a lot of the jobs <laughs> and um, Prague always kind of controlled everything. Prague was always the spokesperson for the whole nation of Czechoslovakia. So I'm, I'm not sure resentment is quite the right word, but definitely a sense of like, finally, we get to be our own, our own person, our own figure on the national stage. And um, it does seem that it was kind of engineered between Mechiar and um, who are, I can't remember the name of the Czech counterparts, um, there was obviously going to be real financial advantages to the politicians who brokered the divorce. And nowadays, it seems to me that huge numbers of Slovaks um, are just draining out of Slovakia and going to the Czech Republic because there are just more options there or into England or farther afield. So whether it was a long term, a good economic or political decision, I don't know. I guess people vote with their feet to a certain extent. Um, I don't ever didn't ever hear like open dislike of Czechs, though. I mean, it, that was always kind of, you know, they, they'd been together all this time. It was more just like excitement for what the future future might hold. Okay, all right. So the uh, next person up for question is uh, Ed Snyder. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I really loved it. I was in Slovakia 
1993 in the summer in a language oh. program in Bratislava. And then I did field work as an anthropologist in 94 and 95. Uh, my question to you is, and I loved your presentation, a 17-year-old in Slovakia. I'm curious about what your impression of Slovaks who were your age had with their understanding about um, uh, Western culture and their engagement with it. And I'll, I'll just give you a, a little bit of an, a vignette. Uh, I I was on um, on the Danube um, on a boat when I first got there, and some young kids that I knew had uh, T-shirts that they had made into concert shirts. Uh, one of them was U2, which they handmade because they could not find this these things to buy on the market in any way. So I'm just curious about your own experience and, and how um, youth were linking to the West um, at that time when you were there. Yeah, I mean, as I recall, everything American was totally awesome. <laughs> They're just like, uh, to the point that probably they could not conceive that not all Americans were rich, like including our poor missionary family. Um, and um, the fact that actually for myself as an Amer a teenager in America, I had gone to great lengths to distinguish myself from general American culture. Like I did not like any of the 80s or early 90s bands. I was a Beatles purist all the way. And um, I hadn't seen all the movies that everyone else had seen. And, you know, I, I probably watched more TV shows in common, but there were lots of ways in which I was very ardently not a typical American teenager. And so um, I think I was disappointing <laughs> to a fair number of Slovak youth who were um, expecting me to have strong feelings about George Michael, for example. <laughs> and uh, um, I think I've heard his name. Um, and, you know, like probably they expected me to dress differently than I did. <laughs> My uh, fashion sense was uh, not great then or ever. And, um, but one particular thing that ended up becoming a very important plot point in my ridiculous romances is that I had all of the Beatles songs on tape. And um, even then it was hard to come by Beatles music. And, you know, I know that under communism, the pirated distribution of Beatles music was a really big deal. And so once word got out that I had them, I had like these streams of boys coming to ask if I could translate lyrics for them or make recordings for them and so forth. So uh, that particular connection was important. Ironically, uh, and I, I still don't quite understand this, but some among the, the church youth leadership and group um, were convinced that the Beatles would put um, evil spirits inside of you. And so you had to refuse to listen to them if you were a good Christian, um, which I, of course, um, a pastor's kid who um, grew up with the Beatles all my life was like, well, it's too late for me now. I mean, if that's what they do, it's, you know, there's no one doing it. <laughs> But um, that was also another interesting way in which American pop culture was already getting some kind of, of pushback or maybe one aspect of, I know they're British, not American, but for all intents and purposes, or was being traded in for other aspects of American culture, like maybe some of the conservative church culture um, that was kind of flooding in the same time that we came and um, kind of responding to the post-communist situation as if there had never been any Christians there or that there hadn't been a church that had suffered tremendously for 40 years and was trying to figure out what to do. It was very easy for Americans of a certain stripe to sweep in with uh, fancy programming and, and no history and no compromise. Um, so that was maybe the, the darker side of that pop culture aspect. All right, thanks for your question, Ed. Um, all right, um, does anyone else have a question for, uh, for Sarah here? All right, James, go ahead. I just have a, a kind of practical question about how you came to publish the book. Um, <laughs> Thornbush Press, I had never heard of this before. Could, um, what was your thinking about going this route? Uh, and did, did you try to find uh, another publisher? 
Uh, yes, that is a great question. Um, so when I first had the manuscript together, I submitted it to maybe 20 literary agents in New York City. Um, two of them actually bothered to respond to say thanks, but no thanks. The other 18 simply ignored me. And then the pandemic hit. <laughs> And um, I started listening to uh, podcasts and looking into publishing news and realized that public, the, like um, what we think of as mainstream publishing was in a tailspin that has lost huge portions of market share. And so between that, for lots of reasons, between that and the fact that a pandemic was going to make any risky proposition a total no-go, I realized um, none of these agents care about Slovakia. They may have heard of it. They may not. And no, none of them are going to take a chance on a book that is all about this unknown country and probably is a little bit too religious to be entirely comfortable. So then I kind of considered my options. I looked at some smaller presses. Um, but what I discovered in the process is that um, the two major barriers to entry for publishing have been removed. The first is print on demand. Almost every book you get now actually is print on demand, even, I mean, unless basically it's Stephen King, and then it makes sense to do a print run because they are all going to sell out anyway. Um, almost every book you get is print on demand. And the price differential for a mainstream publisher or one single book is negligible. The other barrier to entry was marketing. And, um, but that has changed radically too. No mainstream publisher will take you now unless you already are doing massive marketing. You have a email list or an Instagram or Facebook following of a certain size and they're certain that they can recoup their investments. At which point you have to say, if I can produce it myself and I have to market myself anyway, why would I give 95% of my profits to a publisher who will look at the sales in the first week and if they're not bestseller, will drop the book. And Countless main trade published authors will tell you this is exactly what happened. So at that point, my um, refusal to play well with others kicked in and I said, well, heck, I'm just going to start my own press. And the result is Thornbush Press. And um, I now have six books, um, not all by me. <laughs> but uh, but that is um, that's why you've never heard of Thornbush Press before, because it, it's in my my own pet project. So maybe we'll be hearing more about it. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. You can go to thornbushpress.com and uh, find links for all ways to buy the book as uh, well as the other projects there. And I did put a link in the chat, so cool. for all Thank those you. who are interested. So uh, who is next for a question? You can raise your hand or you can just unmute. Okay, I'll be brave. Um, this <laughs> one, this, bridge. Yeah. this one, um, Sarah, if you would step aside, and it, I'll address my question to your mom and dad, Paul and and Ellen, who are here. Um, what were your reactions after you read Sarah's book, um, the finished product, um, and then looked back and compared it to your own uh, memories of? Um, of that year that Sarah spent in Slovakia. Well, I'll go. I'll go first. Okay. And if Will wants to uh, speak up too, that would be interesting. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first. Um, I think uh, Sarah um, made us sound better and wiser than we actually were. <laughs> it was uh, it was a very challenging year, and uh, the cultural uh, challenges were huge. Um, <clears throat> And we had no idea that she was living this rich, emotional, romantic life. <laughs> Paul, go ahead. Well, I think that's true. When, you're, when a father and mother read the intimate thoughts of their 17-year-old daughter 20 years after the fact, it's quite a revelation. <laughs> <clears throat> but I think that uh, Sarah does a great job in this book of, uh, of conveying to an American or an English speaking audience uh, a couple of really remarkable things. This uh, agrarian peasant uh, culture of the Slovaks and its in intrinsic charms, uh, what's appealing about it, this traditional way of life, 
uh, of a small and obscure people on the larger world stage. Uh, that gets conveyed very beautifully in the book. Uh, and also the historical event of the uh, collapse of communism and the Sarah doesn't, didn't mention in her talk, but we lived there in the 90s during Mechiadismus, the, uh, the temptation to go in an authoritarian direction under the leadership of Mechiad. And what a struggle it was for the Slovak uh, people to reject that course uh, without really knowing what the future would be uh, as an alternative. Uh, so those were, we were very, very dramatic times that we were there. And a very enriching as well, I would say. Well, I would just like to add for the record that I have a 16 year old son, so I'm on high alert, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it sounds like, hi, this, this was wonderful. Um, I really appreciate I'm excited to read your book. Um, it sounds like none of y'all live there anymore. And I'm curious why that is. And, and I, you may have mentioned it and I missed it. I didn't, probably mom and dad should answer. I went to college, so <laughs> that's why I'm not. <laughs> but mom and dad can give their answer for why they're not there anymore. Um, I'll say that uh, we lived there for six years and realized that uh, either we needed to come back to the US and um, uh, take up our lives again as Americans or else stay in Slovakia and go native. And um, for a lot of reasons, mostly related to family, we really felt that it was time to come home. Uh, having said that in the 21 years since we left Slovakia in 99, 22 years, we still uh, uh, keep in contact with a lot of our friends and Paul's former students there and go back uh, as often as we can. And Slovakia continues to be a huge part of our lives. It certainly is very close to our hearts and we follow what's going on there with uh, great interest. Just briefly, uh, I was six years teaching at the theological faculty in Bratislava <clears throat> and I became a, a symbol of the younger generation and its aspirations in conflict with the older generation and its resentments. And it became clear to me after six years that uh, I had done what I could to equip and empower the younger generation who were my students. Uh, and I'm happy to report that after 20 some years, that has, I've seen that the fruit of that, these people that I taught in the 90s are now in leadership positions. Uh, if I had stayed, I would have been the uh, focus of a conflict between the older generation and the young people. And I didn't want to, uh, uh, I didn't want to uh, be a cause of that kind of a conflict. Uh, and so I discreetly removed myself from the situation and took a teaching position back in the United States. Sarah, let me ask one more question. Um, you mentioned your 16 year old son and you're on high alert. Has he <laughs> read the book? And if so, what did you think about it? Well, I'm joking a bit there. I just echoing my, my parents comment that you never really know what your teenager is thinking. But um, having gone back to my 17 year old self, I can infer. <laughs> Uh, he started to read it and he got so irritated at Misho, uh, I presumably because Misho is not his dad, <laughs> that he couldn't carry on. <laughs> uh, he also commented once that um, he, Zeke, my son's name is Zeke, that he's um, probably quite a bit like Misho as well, more of the, uh, the charmer type. So um, realizes what a, <laughs> a danger to society a charming young man can be. <laughs> All right. I think James has a question too. Yes, yes, I was going to go to James. Yeah, yeah, I, I was inspired by the recent discussion of life um, about reasons for leaving, but about the '90s more generally. As you may know, the '90s are now a subject of nostalgia in Slovakia, and for those of us who lived through it, it's 
seems kind of surprising that <laughs> something we lived through could be a, an object of nostalgia. But when you look back at, on your time in Slovakia in the 90s, do you feel nostalgic for anything? And if so, what? I was only there for a year and then visits, but I can say that for me, it was just the, the pre-transformation. When I go back there now, I, I feel like um, I'm like have a, like a augmented reality lenses on. So like one lens is 1993 and then one lens is, you know, 2018. That was the last time I was there and I'm seeing this dual track Slovakia. And um, yeah, I kind of miss the Slovakia without shopping malls, I have to say, or without all the, the fast food and the throngs of tourists. Um, if you, the farther you get out from Bratislava, the less you see that. But for me, I would say it's purely this kind of like selfish cultural desire for the cute old village life. I'm sure if I had to live the cute old village life, I'd be really happy to welcome in the 21st century. <laughs> okay, we have, I guess we have time for at least one more question. So anyone, um, now is your chance folks. Okay, in your sermons, how often do you tell stories about Slovakia? Um, I never do tell anecdotes in my sermons at all. I am a strict expository preacher of the Bible. So, sorry, <laughs> but it's a good question. And if you're dying for my sermons, they're on YouTube. Just search for my name. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up. So Sarah, thank, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And also thanks to the other Himmelitskis who, who joined us tonight to add a bit more depth to the, or some background to the, to the story here. So it was oh, great it was having you. Yeah. It was a real joy to be able to present with you. And I'm, I'm really grateful you all took time on your Thursday evening to join this. And um, like I mentioned, my, my, I have a website, sarahhinlickywilson.com. So please feel free to drop by and send me a message. If you have your own Brave Bridge stories you would like to share with me, I'd love to hear them. Great. And uh, yeah, just to remind everyone, uh, tonight's presentation was recorded. So we'll have it uploaded to our YouTube channel pretty soon. So we'll share that with, um, we'll share that with you and you can share, you can share it with your friends also too. And so with that, uh, I'd like to wish everyone a good evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Dziękuję. Dobro noc. Dobro noc. <laughs>